Hi there, I'm Didi Kiri. In this video, we'll go through the UI and everything you should do before you unpause. It might seem like a lot, but no one ever said that starting out in RimWorld would be easy. By the way, this is vanilla RimWorld, including the royalty DLC. These three pawns are the ones that I selected in the last tutorial video. So we've got our construction, cooking and medical skill covered. If you want to start a new game but don't know how to go about it and what pawns to pick, have a look at my previous RimWorld video. Okay, so before you unpause, take a look around the map. Usually you want to start building your base in the middle, so that raiders take a short while to get to you, at least. Still, it might not be the best spot for you. So what you want to look out for is, for example, the rich soil. For us, that's right here. It's important to know where the rich soil is because crops usually grow fast on it. Not every crop, but you'll see what I mean later. So rich soil is dark brown, but don't confuse it with mud. Mud is also dark brown. We have it right here already. This is mud. When you mouse over the ground and also objects, you can see what it is and some basic information about it. Look at the bottom left corner for this. So here it says mud. Walk speed is 48%, so we're considerably slower here. And it's also lit 69%. That's the, like, the default lighting. Over here then you see this is rich soil. Walk speed is 87%. But the important part is fertility. 140%. In comparison to just normal soil, it's 100%. There is an easier way to actually find rich soil though. I mean, you, you have the distinction between brown soil here and brown soil here, but something that immediately pops into your eye is that here we've got lots of grass, bushes, trees, here nothing is growing. However, there is an easier way. At the bottom right corner, there is a circular symbol with a little plant in it. Click it and you see the fertility overlay. Now the fertility is color coded. If we zoom out here, you can see it very nicely. The dark green is where it's very fertile, 140%. The light green is just a usual soil, 100% fertility. The yellow would be 70%. You can still grow stuff here, but not everything. So you have yellow, light green, dark green. This is a good way to distinguish where the growing zones are. Next, you want to know if you have mountains that you can eventually use to fortify your base. This map looks really good, actually. So if we settle right here already, it can be easily defended. Because here, this is closed off, this is closed off. Enemies could come from the right here, from the top, top here as well, from the left. So if we settle here, we close this off, we close this off, can be easily defended. So that's actually a good spot. Um, if you don't have mountains, it doesn't really matter, you can defend any base. But if you have them, why not use them? Another thing that might come with mountains, I should say, is caves. With or without insects. Caves are like this one. If you have mountains, make sure to look around for caves. Because if you have insects in them, like here, mega spiders for example, you don't want your pawns just run in there by accident, unsuspecting, and then, you know, be attacked and die. That would be really unfortunate. So we have we have actually two caves here. One one down here. And the other one is up here. Here we don't have insects. We have three caves. Two two with insects, but three caves. There's another one. We want to restrict those. As I said, you don't want your colonists to go in there and die. We'll do that later. Another thing to look out for are steam geysers. Steam geysers are basically holes in the ground, like this one. Steam geysers eventually. Uh, you'll get a research and then you can put geothermal generators on them. So basically just what you want to know is it's a thing and you will use it later. So make sure you don't build too close to it. Leave a bit of space so that you can put the generator there eventually. Now you can look around the whole map and check for ruins uh, to see if there are any objects or materials you want to claim or salvage, deconstruct. Usually that'd be walls, could be steel, could be stone walls, urns, tables, simple things really. I I already checked and there's nothing here. So, I mean, that's okay too. What we have here is ship chunk. We can deconstruct that later for resources. Other than that, I couldn't find anything of use, but that's okay. While you look around, maybe you can spot an ancient danger on your tile. Not every map tile has it and you might not even be able to see it. So. I couldn't find it here, but it could also be inside the mountain. So there is not a guaranteed chance to actually find it immediately without without mining into the mountain. 
but what is an agent danger? So if you see a room that he can't look into that has fog of war, basically, that's it. A room without a door, very important. So that could be just, you know, in the middle of the map, just a room, you know, it's roofed, you can't see inside, it has no door, or it could just, you know, peek out of a mountain, for example, or it could be hidden completely in a mountain. That would be an ancient danger. Or you not, you can actually take a pawn, go close to it, and then you get a message saying that, oh, wait, this is an ancient danger, be careful here. It's all good, you can't really accidentally open this. Okay, now that we've looked at our surroundings, we should probably uh, take a closer look at the UI. At the very top, in the middle of the screen, you'll see your colonists. And eventually guests that might be visiting due to a quest, but I think the quests with guests are royalty DLC exclusive features. We already talked about the info box in the bottom left. Uh, I mainly use it to check for lighting. Most of the pawns don't want to work in an unlit room. They will get moody, but also they just work better if it's lit. And also shooting will be more accurate. In the bottom right, you'll see information on mouse over as well. Currently, we, you know, it doesn't really change for us, but you see it's outdoors, 14 Celsius. Um, if you mouse over a room, it would say indoors and the temperature there. So this is very important for checking if people are freezing or overheating inside. If you've maybe missed to build one roof tile and the room, the room that you thought would be completely done is actually outdoors still. Other than that, it points out the weather. So currently it's clear. It points out the time. So six hours will be the time at six in the morning. The date, the season, currently we have spring. And then uh, the time button is to pause, speed up the game. Below that, there are very useful overlays and functions. Let's start with this one. A toggle categorized mode on the resource readout. Yeah, currently I can't show you that because we haven't actually done anything. So I'm going to do that in the next video. But just know that once you have a stockpile zone and you have resources in that stockpile, on the top left, you'll have every single item listed, basically. But here you can toggle on the categorized mode. So you'd have, for example, a category for food, and then you can collapse that for, you know, what kind of food do I have? Do I have meals? Do I have raw materials? And so on. So that's quite nice. Here then, toggle automatic rebuild of destroyed structures in the home area. Usually you want everything you've built to be in the home area, because then your pawns will go there and repair it if needed. I recommend turning this on because something could be destroyed due to a fire, due to a pawn going berserk and just destroying things, due to a raid. And if raiders come and break, I don't know, your power generator or a wall, you want your people to repair this without you thinking about it and placing another blueprint. So I recommend turning this on. Then toggle automatically expanding the home area around new constructions. Ah, this is, this is very controversial. Some people love it, some people hate it. I recommend having this turned on in the beginning because then you don't have to think about it. So if you're new with RimWorld starting out, yes, have this enabled because then every time they build something, the home zone will spread around it. Eventually, I always turn it off because I don't want my people to go, you know, let's say... I, I have to make a growing zone here. I have to build something for whatever reason. The game will automatically generate a home zone. But home zone means that people will go there to repair it and also clean. I don't want my people to waste their day going over there to clean when, you know, no one's ever going to be there. So in the beginning, don't worry about it. Have it turned on. It, it's okay. Eventually, when you have more control, when you know what's going on, you probably don't need it. You can turn it off, but then you have to remember to make a manual home zone wherever you want it. The next one, toggle visibility of terrain affordance. So that just means you can't build every kind of structure on every ground. Let's turn this off again. What you see here, this is deep water. This is shallow water. Here we've got mud. Obviously, you can't build anything in, in deep water. That doesn't work out. There are bridges, for example. Bridges can be can be placed in shallow water. And then, here, this is red, the mud. You can build on mud, but only light structures. You can't put heavy structures on there. So, if you want to build a wall, for example, on mud, it doesn't support 
heavy structures, it's not gonna work. You can still build wooden walls on there, but then you always need a bridge beneath to stabilize it, basically. That's what this is about. We've already seen the fertility overlay. Toggle visibility of roofs. Even though we haven't built a single structure yet, you can still see the roofs. You see, for example, that those are actually caves. So the dark green means it's overhead mountain. The light green means it's a rock roof. It's thin. You can actually deconstruct this. Overhead mountain can never be deconstructed. It can collapse, however. Be aware of that. Oh, visibility of roofs is also quite nice. If you build a room and for some reason your people haven't finished the roof or at some point you said, don't build a roof there, you forgot about it, now you want one. This is good to, you know, check for holes in your roof. Sometimes it's needed. Toggle colonist bar, you can, you can turn this off. Um, I don't know why, screenshots maybe, but usually it's good to know how many people you have, where to find them quickly and so on. Toggle a room stats display. Currently we don't have rooms, but room stats would be how big it is, how dirty, um, how beautiful, and so on. So this is the thing. Once we have a room, I can show you how this works. Toggle a beauty display. This works even though we don't have a room yet. If you toggle this, you get like a radius of numbers showing the beauty. Flowers, for example. Let's zoom in here. Flowers have a beauty of three, over there. Everything basically just ground is minus one, not very pretty to look at. Chunks are minus nine and so on. So if you have this enabled, you can just mouse over everything, have a look and see the beauty. Visibility of zones. We, we don't have zones yet. So um, yeah, I recommend having this on, especially in the beginning when you're starting out. So you, you know, you find your zones again. And then the last one is toggle visibility of the learning helper when it is empty. The learning helper, if you have it enabled, would be in the top right corner, giving you tips about the game. It is not very extensive, so obviously when you're starting out, I recommend having it enabled and just, you know, read what the learning helper has to say. But also it's not going to be enough to fully understand the game. Then we move on to the bottom bar of the game. This is the menu. Let's just go through all of them. That's going to take a while, but also we're actually going to do things now. So the architect one holds orders for your, for your pawns, zones that you can build like stockpile and growing zone, and then just things you can build, structures, furniture, security, doors, ship. Just have a look at all of that, familiarize with what you've got in the, in the beginning. And eventually we're going to use this to build. Work gives you a list of your colonists and their work priorities. Currently, you see whether they do or do not have a job, but that's not enough to have a fully functioning colony. So what we're going to do is toggle the manual priorities. Click on the X here. This um, might look like a nightmare to you, but it's actually not that bad. Let's just take it slow and I'll walk you through it. What you need to know is that priority one is done first. Priority four is done last. Jobs on the left have a higher priority than jobs on the right. This is what this says. So firefighting, as it is currently, everything is set on a three, right? Firefighting comes before being a patient, doctor, bed rest, basic, warden, handle, cook, and so on. From left to right, higher priority, one is higher than four. Okay, so far, so good. However, this is not efficient. Currently, everybody has the same priority everything into not everybody does everything we need to fix this the squares are somewhat color-coded the dark gray means that they're very bad at, at that job for example currently it says mining will not do but that's only because we haven't set it we haven't set that person to do it basically what you need to look out for is the average of relevant skill zero out of 20 so they're really not the best pick for this it doesn't matter though because you know, sometimes you just don't have anybody who's good at that, so you need someone to do it. It's still gonna work, but they won't be very efficient. The light grey means, you know, they've got a bit of skill, they're not the best, but yeah, you know, it's alright. And that goes on. So the lighter it is, the brighter it is, the better they are. This is a skill of 7, for example. 
doctoring this is very bright this is 12 and then we go to the yellow and the yellow means the, the skill is super super good 16 out of 20. so this can already help you determine who is going to do what and then you see the flames those little flames here one flame means they have a passion for it which means they're just going to be quicker learning this be more efficient if they have two flames they, it's even better they learn it even faster they're even better at it so basically what you want to do you want people who have those little flames there preferably two flames to do that job they might not be really good at the skill but they can learn it faster than others so look out for those flames and then if a square has a red frame that means they have been assigned to do something that they're bad at just so that you're aware well, you know, sometimes that's just necessary. So what you want to do now is look at the skill level and assign the best person to do the job and have everything covered. Don't be scared to mess around with this. There will be times where you have to come back to this and adjust it or just completely change priorities. Whenever there's a new person joining, you have to do it for that new person. But also if you've got people that are, you know, somewhat similar, you can use the copy and then paste button to just copy it. Here are a couple tips to help you set this up. First, you can always mouse over a box to see the person's skill. Average of relevant skill, 11 of 20. You can do that here too. 2 of 20, 4 of 20. So you can always do that without going to the colonists, to the bio and looking at the skill. If you right click on, wait, let's go here to handling, for example. Oh, actually to warden, because then everybody is able to do that. So if you right click on a job, it sorts your colonists in a descending order. Another right click will ascend the order. Another one removes the filter. You can also do a left click. So if you start with a left click, you can actually see that arrow here. Um, this is now the uh, ascending order. Here we've got the descending order. So they start with five, four, and then the three. So I prefer it in a descending order so that I know the best one is at the top. So this could also help you determine who's going to do wardening, for example, because you really don't need three wardens with that small of a colony. Okay, you can change the numbers, which you need to do to set a priority by left clicking or right clicking. So if you left click, it starts with a four, then a three, two, one, it goes up. If you right click, it goes down. But now comes the good part. You probably want all your people to fight fires, right? But it's tedious to set the priorities for all of them. Firefighting, one. With three people, and then especially with one person who can't do this, um, not that bad. But the more people you have, the, the more tedious it is to click for everybody, right? Try shift and then left or right click in the mouse on the job. So I hold down shift. I press left mouse button and it goes up for all the people. You can do the same with the patient because you probably want them to be a patient. I'll just say two. Doctoring, why not? They're both good, let's do this. Bed rest, let's say as a two. If they have a serious infection or something, I'll put this to one. And I want everybody to do basic. That would be like flicking a switch, for example. If you want to get special things done quickly, be sure to not set a priority to one on anything unimportant. What I mean by that is, Let's say this is our main cook. It's set to one. But now the cook is incapacitated and you need someone else. And that someone else, for example, let's say um, Gaines, needs to be our second cook because we, do, you know, nobody else can do it. But Gain is handling and then growing and after that, you know, plant cutting and stuff. So now you need Gaines to cook. And it's urgent. But as it is now, Priority one, done first, left with a higher priority, which means Gaines would do firefighting, doctoring, handling, before cooking. And then, you know, in order to change this, you'd have to do everything that's on the left that is not super important to make it a lower priority. However, what you can do is just make sure none of the jobs that are not super important are on a one. Because if they're not, Let's say if everything's on a two, right? And then you need something done quickly. Let's say it's tailoring. You can set this to a one. 
and they will do it after firefighting, doctoring, basic. So I recommend having two as your highest priority for a job that is not vital for the colony. That just makes it easier for you eventually. Now let's have some fun and go nuts, assign everybody to the right jobs and make sure it works. Okay, so what I've done now is I made sure that every job is done by someone except for hunting because I do hunting differently. That's for a different matter. So when starting out, make sure you've got a hunter as well, but make sure you've got a hunter that has a long range weapon. I suppose that'd be you then. Good. Other than that, um, I also made sure that to not give everybody too many jobs because if you have everybody to do everything as a second priority, um, only the jobs on the left will get done. So we have a miner, Guy Gaines is our miner, so the others don't need to do it. Constructing, I set two people to do that with different priorities, so we're going to see how that works. Sometimes you just, you know, people don't have to do anything. So what I do is put everybody on research, even though they're bad. I've got the, my main researcher for wise and the others do it as a last resort, basically. Before they just stand around, don't do anything, they do that. Hauling and cleaning are very, very important. But since the basically everybody is busy with things, I'll leave it at that. But there will come a time very soon where I have to adjust this and make other people haul as well. But yeah, so so much for the work priorities. This can be a bit overwhelming in the beginning, but really take your time. If it doesn't work out, like if you set the priorities and it doesn't work out the way you want it to, you can always come back, readjust it, fiddle around with it. You can make this work. Now moving on to the schedule. Again, you will find a list of your colonists. Here, you'll tell them when to sleep, work, meditate if you have the royalty DLC, um, have recreation or do anything else. Before you do anything here, go back to your colonists and look at the traits. Because if you have a night owl, you want to know. So click on the colonist, click on bio, here you have the traits. A night owl wants to work at night, sleep during the day, but we don't have one, so we're good. So we'll go back to the schedule and have a look. Currently, they're set to sleep from 10 p.m. at night to 5 a.m. in the morning and do anything in the meantime. Anything can be then, you know, anything. If they're tired, they're going to sleep. If they're hungry, they're going to eat. If they need recreation, they're going to get that. Problem is, if there is a fire, if someone's bleeding out and you've set them to sleep, they will sleep, even though the job priority might be on a one. But, you know, you told them to sleep, so they're going to sleep. So be careful with that. Also, same goes for when they're set to work. If you make them work eight hours a day, they get hungry in between, but they're not allowed to have a break. That's going to be bad. They will be grumpy and moody and they might break then. Break as in have a mental break. What I usually do is reduce the sleep hours, set that to anything, and then schedule two hours of recreation in the morning. No matter if they're night owl or not, I want recreation to be at the same time because then they can hang out and form relationships together, which is a good thing. Here, the copy paste function comes in very handy. so. I've just changed the first one exactly how I want it to be. I'll paste it on the others. I don't really set them to work. If I need something done very quickly for a quest, for example, you know, I, I might do it, but really I just have them sleep for a couple hours, recreate at the same time, and the rest is just anything. On the right over here, you see all your areas. And here you can restrict the movement to one of these areas. Currently, they're allowed to go anywhere, so they're unrestricted. Home zone doesn't really exist because we haven't built anything yet. And then there's area one. Area one is always a default area. And there is nothing in it. Feel free to use it if you want. But what we're going to do, we need to restrict the access so that they don't go into the caves. So we're going to click on manage areas. As I said, feel free to use area one already, but I'm going to make a new one. Click on this and you can rename it. We're going to call it no insects. Perfect. So now we've just made a new area, but there is nothing in it yet. So you need to go to architect, zone, and then expand the allowed area. Select the one that you want to choose. For me, no insects. Now we go to the insects. How this works is you click and drag. This is your zone now. You can also clear it again here. 
clear layout area, select your area, click and drag. What we want to do is we don't want our people to go in there. So basically, I have to paint everything but the caves in that zone. It's going to be tedious, it's going to take a long while, but there's a workaround, we can just invert it. So what I'll do is, I'll just say, you know, these are the caves, don't go there, it doesn't have to be perfect, but don't go there. By painting that now and then inverting it. Be careful though, because here for example, if they're not allowed to go here, which we're, you know, we're going to tell them that, they are allowed to be left of the mountain and right of the mountain. And here is a path. So even if then they will never go and work here, they might still go through there. So eventually, if you have caves, you want to make sure that you block them off so that your people don't go through there. Now that I've painted the caves, we go back to manage areas, invert it. And now, when you mouse over that zone, so we can do that. We can do that here. No insects. Means they are allowed to go everywhere else but here. They're not gonna work there, but they might still go through there because pathing. Now that we've made that zone, be sure to actually put your people on that zone. Don't forget that. It happened to me very, very often. Just check. Check the schedule. Check where they're allowed to be. Now they're in the no insect zone, which means they're a little bit safer. Well, this turned out longer than expected. Let's make this part one of things to do before you unpause, and we'll go through the rest in part two. As always, if you want to see me play RimWorld or other indie games live on stream, head on over to twitch.tv slash 2 Feel free to also check out my Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon. Thank you for watching this video, and if you enjoyed it, please subscribe to the channel.